you, Marcy. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, the first part of that title is right. The subtitle, you know, has kind of evolved, so it'll just kind of ignore the second part of the subtitle. Um, but the, you know, you have a lot of handouts, too. We'll, we'll not probably look at absolutely every single thing, but it'll all tie together. Finding the source. Wine gets better as it ages, up to a point. So do blue jeans. Poets, along with basket weavers, pool hustlers, and rodeo clowns, also tend to improve over time. In accordance with the principle that dutiful practice of any craft leads generally toward, if not in a direct line, to perfection. Needless to say, there are abundant counterexamples to disprove the rule. Writers who stall out, writers who regress, writers who give up and disappear. Wordsworth spent his later decades revising the youthful genius out of the poetry he had written in his 20s. Rambo published his first poems at the age of 15, and by 21, tired of being an enfant terrible, gave up writing, moved to Ethiopia, and spent his last years selling guns to local warlords. On the other hand, there are those poets who fail to improve only because they seem to have arrived in the art fully formed, like Athena sprung from the head of Zeus. The prodigal perfectionism of Elizabeth Bishop comes to mind. So does the work of poets like Sharon Olds and Jack Gilbert, who develop a signature style early in a career and sustain its mastery over many decades. It is no coincidence that Athena, among her many attributes, was the patron goddess of artisans and craftsmen. And then there is a type of poet whose progress is not of the slow and steady, but rather a dramatic leap into the unknown. I'm not talking about writers at the beginning of their careers who are necessarily engaged in a shape-shifting quest for authenticity, but poets who, having established a significant presence in one poetic mode, dramatically transform their work, rising to new levels of literary achievement. I'd like to subdivide those poets into two groups based on the nature of their transformation. The first and more common consists of poets whose work undergoes an overarching change at the level of composition, a formal reinvention on the page. The second group contains those who radically re-envision the entirety of their poetics and their poetic subject, a more complex metamorphosis to address. One thing both groups share is a willingness to abandon familiar terrain in search of a greener pasture on the other side of the fence, the fearlessness to plunge into the unknown. I called this talk Finding the Source, mostly because they needed a title and I didn't have one yet, but also because I was thinking in this context about the long contested source, search rather, for the source of the Nile, dating all the way back to Roman times. A history of heroic journeys leading to wrong answers, false leads, faulty assumptions, apocryphal claims, and a variety of African streams and ponds mistaken for the real thing by European explorers in white pith helmets. This analogy poses, let us say, a few difficulties. But there is still this truth, that for many of us, finding our voice resembles that arduous search for the Nile's headwaters, or to switch to a happier North American metaphor, a lonesome trek into the wilderness in quest of gold. And so a better title would be The Prospector's Dilemma. Because once you've found your voice, once you've staked your claim, once you've struck pay dirt, how do you stomach the risk of packing up the gear, saddling up the mule, and striking out across that endless desert of borax and creosote in search of El Dorado? To begin to answer the question, let's start by considering some examples of the more common of our two risk-taking types, risk types, poets who undertake a dramatic, formal reinvention of their work. Obviously, writing is never a static enterprise. All poets evolve, sometimes idiosyncratically, sometimes by joining groups or movements, sometimes in concert with large-scale literary trends. Many American poets born in the early decades of the last century experienced a common aesthetic trajectory, moving away from the formal poetics they were taught as students, embracing free verse across a huge spectrum of possibility in its place. 
In essence, there was no going back to the past once modernism broke the mold and swept the shattered pieces into the trash can. Examples of this biographical arc range from Galway Canal to Adrian Rich, and their personal narratives of escape from formalism's shackles parallel the various social, personal, and political liberations unfolding in the latter decades of the century. James Wright also belongs to this cohort. His first two highly lauded books, written in the 1950s, are traditional collections of frost-like sonnets, blank verse meditations, and colloquial tetrameter musings on Midwestern themes. A, mid a Winter's Day in Ohio is an elegy for Wright's teacher, the poet and scholar Philip Timberlake, and that's the first poem in my handout and the first one I'd like to look at. A Winter's Day in Ohio. Clever, defensive, seasoned animals, Plato and Christ deny your grave. But man, who slept for years alone, will turn his face alone to the common wall before his time. Between the woodchuck and the cross, alone all afternoon, I take my time to mourn. I am too old to cry against the snow of roots and stars drifting above your face. It's an entirely admirable poem. In eight iambic pentameter lines, Wright demonstrates his, me his metrical dexterity, his typically stoic and isolated voice, and his commitment to a Midwestern vernacular. Between the woodchuck and the cross is where Wright's lonely narrators stake their claim, refusing to cry, though still wishing for an end to the wintry weather in their souls, and unsure whether their savior is more likely to be Jesus Christ or Punxsutawney Phil. Poets of Wright's era often adopted a tone of existential malaise hazed by European cigarette smoke, but Wright's despair feels entirely American. If the former resemble figures in a film by Godard or Rossellini, Wright is straight out of Nicholas Ray's They Drive by Night. But however formally adept, however heartfelt, this small poem still feels mannered and dated like much of Wright's early work, not only to contemporary readers, but to Wright himself. On the verge of releasing a third volume of formal verse, Wright underwent a visionary reawakening. Under the local influence of Robert Bly and the more general aegis of Pablo Neruda, George Trackall, and Po Chu Yi. Denouncing his old work as genteel, do-it-yourself New Yorker verse, Wright embraced the new imagination championed in Bly's magazine, The 50s, and threatened to quit writing altogether if he could not find and promulgate it. I see blood in the matter, Wright railed in a 10-page letter to Bly. I really do. Uh, by the way, I'd like to credit Charles de Niord for showing me that letter just uh, two days ago. Wright withdrew his third manuscript, went back to the drawing board, and in 1963 published instead his masterpiece, The Branch Will Not Break, most of Wright's best-known poems are from this slender book, including A Blessing, a poem about as universally admired as anything written in the last half century. Let's read A Blessing. Just off the highway in Rochester, Minnesota, twilight bounds softly forth on the grass, and the eyes of those two Indian ponies darken with kindness. They have come gladly out of the willows to welcome my friend and me. We step over the barbed wire into the pasture where they have been grazing all day alone. They ripple tensely. They can hardly contain their happiness that we have come. They bow shyly as wet swans. They love each other. There is no loneliness like theirs. At home once more, they begin munching the young tufts of spring in the darkness. I would like to hold the slenderer one in my arms, for she has walked over to me and nuzzled my left hand. She is black and white, her mane falls wild on her forehead, and the light breeze moves me to caress her long ear that is delicate as the skin over a girl's wrist. Suddenly I realize that if I stepped out of my body, I would break into blossom. Uh, it is a great poem, and it's actually so commonly taken to be a great poem that I'm not going to make most of the comments about its greatness. It also includes that word, suddenly, that we were, that we were talking about the other day in another context, so just as a sidebar. 
you know, the romantics always use suddenly, and that's why Mary sought their books out, because they were just trying to express immediacy. Suddenly, suddenly, suddenly. And I think it, you know, as it sounded exciting when Wordsworth said suddenly, and to us it sounds utterly unsudden. Um, Wright took that risk in this poem, but. Syntax, diction, trope, and image, to say nothing of its jagged, freewheeling lineation, just about every element of Wright's poetics have been radically reformed, and his sense of freedom is palpable. Where the morning in the early poem, A Winter's Day in Ohio, feels crabbed or vague, a blessing is steeped in rapturous, sensual joy. It somehow manages to suggest the clarity of a black and white photograph, while at the same time exuding a mysterious, compassionate empathy for seemingly all of life on Earth. Loosed from their metrical straitjacket, Wright's lines in fluid consort with his syntax move down the page, a sentence per line, sometimes a full clause or a short introductory phrase. Only in the last three lines does he resort to a sequence of harsh enjambments, rendering both psychic processes vividly active, the realization Wright undergoes and the breakage he imagines as a kind of violent spiritual efflorescence. These lines are rightly read as a groping desire for transcendence, but I can't avoid hearing the joyful yawp of the poet as practitioner. I have broken out of the body cast of formal verse, and my poetry, like wild skunk cabbage along the Ohio River, has blossomed anew. That was me, not James Wright. That was me channeling James Wright. <laughs> so the essence of my argument there, to step out of the paper, is that this huge formal change in Wright's work is the essential that enabled him to discover the new territory that, he, that the poetry blossomed into, that it's a formal reinvention enabled all of the rest of this spiritual and other growth within the poetics of James Wright. There's a million things to say about that poem. Um, one thing I love about those last two lines also is that break into blossom. By breaking that line at break of, of the many things it does, it breaks apart the somewhat cliched phrase to break into blossom. We say that things break into blossom all the time without ever thinking of breakage. That's just a figure of speech we use as if it were a unit. When you break the line there, you suddenly re, you make new the phrase to break into blossom, and you see the violence of the notion that there's a vi that's a metamorphosis, a really powerful image of transformation. Without the line break, without the formal dexterity, it wouldn't it wouldn't come clear. All right, moving on to a second poet, who again who's, who undergoes a dramatic formal change in their work, and by so doing, just takes their work to a whole place that it had never been before, a, a total a new plateau. A second poet whose work undergoes a formal, a radical formal revamping is C.K. Williams who began his career writing loose-lined conversational poems, often unpunctuated, in a manner fairly representative of the 60s and 70s. Loss, a poem from William's first collection, imagines a metaphysical equivalence between human and divine improvidence. God is like us, a dirt farmer who ruins his own land out of thoughtless ignorance, and we are like him, standing on the front porch, looking at the ruin to which we have reduced our lives in his Edenic pastures. Rather, I should not say we, but he resembles God, as Williams is very much a first-person singular kind of poet. So here's Loss, C.K. Williams. This should be the third poem you guys have. In this day and age, Lord, you are like one of those poor farmers who burns the forests off and murders his land and then can't leave and goes sullen and lean among the rusting yard junk, the scrub, and the famished stock. Lord, I have felt myself raked into the earth like manure, harrowed and plowed under, but I am still enough like you to stand on the porch, chewing a stalk or drinking while tall weeds come up dead and the house dogs snapping their chains like moths howl and point towards the withering meadows at nothing. It's a pretty awesome poem. Lord, I have felt myself raked into the earth like manure, harrowed and plowed under is a great image of suffering and self-excoriation. I love those three strong tensile verbs. But it also focuses the poem squarely upon the narrator, who is enough like God to assume co-billing in the poem. Narcissism, in poetic terms, is really a form of wonderment. Wow, I just cannot believe that I am here on this planet doing the things that I am doing. And any fan of Whitman or British romanticism has to have a stomach for it. 
In his best poems, Williams examines the self with an unparalleled rigor and depth, both analyst and analysand in a long-term psychiatric quest for understanding. But in this, as in other earlier work, the voice of his narratorial eye threatens to disfigure the poem, like a magician blowing too much air into a slender balloon. Like right before him, Williams came up with a radical, formal solution to this crucial identity problem. Beginning with his third book, With Ignorance, and reaching maturity in his extraordinary fourth volume, Tar, Williams invented, or reinvented, a sinuous, hyper-long line that enlarges the poem's discursive terrain, incorporating swaths of data and description. In essence, he transformed the lyric poem into a documentary medium, and Williams turned out to be a brilliant documentarian. This is a little bit of a long poem, but it's very hard to illustrate anything about this development in Williams's career without reading a kind of a long poem. So let, let's read this poem, it's called Soon. And uh, C.K. Williams is from Newark, New Jersey, so presumably this elementary school being described would be in Newark, New Jersey. Soon, the whole lower panel of the chain link fence girdling my old grammar school playground has been stripped from its stanchions and crumpled disdainfully on the shattered pavement. The upper portion sags forlornly, as though whatever maintenance man had to hang at last was too disheartened doing it again to bother tensioning the guy wires to the true. The building's pale, undistinguished stone is sooty. Graffiti cover every surface within reach. Behind their closely woven, galvanized, protective mesh, the windows are essentially opaque. But in the kindergarten and first grade, I can make out skeletons and pumpkins scotch taped up. It's Halloween. The lower grades are having their procession, and I stop a while to watch. Except that everyone is black, the kids, the parents looking on, almost all the teachers. My class, when we were out there, parading in our costumes, sorry, I left a word out there, must have looked about the same. Witches, cowboys, clowns, some supermen and Batman, a Bo Peep and a vampire. I don't think we had robots, or not such realistic ones, and they don't have an Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam, I was Uncle Sam, I remember. With what ardor I conceived my passion to be him, Uncle Sam. The war was on then, everyone was gaga with it. Uncle Sam was everywhere, recruiting, selling bonds, that poster with its virile, foreshortened finger accusing you. And there, at the local dime store, to my incredulous delight, his outfit was. It must have cost enough to mean something in those days, still half in the Depression, but I dwelled on it. The box alone. Uncle Sam was on it in his stovepipe, smiling this time, and there was a tiny window you could see a square of bangles through, a ribbon of lapel. It burned in me. I fretted, nagged, my first instance of our awful fever to consume. When I'd had it half an hour, I hated it. Even at that age, I knew when I'd been cheated. Ill-made, shoddy, the gauzy fabric coarsely dyed with the taste of something evil in its odor. It was waxy with a stiffening gaze, the stiffening that gave it body long enough for you to get it on. Then it bagged and clung and made you feel the fool you'd been to want it in the first place. My cotton batting beard was pasted on and itched, but I knew enough to hold my tongue, the little patriot in his rage of indignation. So much anyway of education went against my will. Fold your hands, raise your hands, the Pledge of Allegiance, prayers and air raid drills. We were taught obsessively to be good citizens, a concept I never quite understood. How the city's changed since then. Downtown businesses have fled, whole blocks are waste. All that's left of what went on between the rioters and guard tanks in the 60s. Here, even the field house on the ballpark where they gave us nature lessons is in shambles. The grass is gone. A frowsy gorse has sprouted from the brick and bottle ridden rubble. The baskets on their court are still intact at least, although the metal nets are torn. Some men who must be from the neighborhood have got a game going out there now. The children circle shyly, hand in hand, as solemn as a frieze of Greeks, while a yard beyond the backboards boom, the players sweat and faint and drive as though everything depended on it. Soon is essentially a catalog of journalistic detail, a sequence of sociological observations about race, class, urban decay, architecture, history, memory, and identity 
And yet, at heart, it is about Williams's own childhood. This sounds like a dangerous formula to inveigle one's personal wants and wounds into a poem about far larger and more compelling social needs. But here, the act of witness undercuts the ego's claim to importance. The self as subject is counterbalanced by William's relentless reportage. The long line not only allows Williams a greater range, it compels him to it. And that range of documentation, that empathic identification with others far outstrips in terms of empathy and understanding the purported claims for compassion loss makes upon its reader. In essence, yourself can still be large, but if you have a very, very large canvas, that self in relative terms remains proportionate. So I think this is a, an example of finding a way for Williams not to diminish himself and his own value of his own self, his experience, but that if one's self is placed in this radically larger context, but to find that context, Williams needed to re reinvent his form. You can't really find that context in those lines, un unpunctuated lines he was writing in, in the 70s. It's just the lyric line can only do so much. He needed to find a new line. He needed to invent some people say he took this line from Whitman, but it's not Whitman's long line. This is a very different long line from Whitman. It's not rhythmically the same. It doesn't, ha it doesn't ha Whitman's long line comes from the Bible, like Ginsburg's long line. This is a very analytical, journalistic long line. It's, it's usually end stopped. It's often a full line sentence or a sentence that runs over two lines. So in a different way, both these poets, Wright and Williams, radically reinvented their form, and in so doing enabled this, a, a huge leap in both the kind of literary value, but in just the kind of depth and impassioned nature of their writing. Okay, so that's the first school. Now, as I know, at this point, like one of those wayward Nile-seeking explorers, I am finally approaching the true object of this talk, which is the second category of self-transforming poets, and in particular, Sylvia Plath. Given how much time I have expended, I will have to move things along at a more rapid pace. As I discuss Plath's transformation from a gifted poet in a familiar mold to a brilliant poet of a completely unique order. To see how our poetry changed in general terms during the very brief seven years of her adult career, let's look at two poems with an almost comic similarity of subject matter. The first, Fiesta Melons, was written in 1956 during her honeymoon in Spain with Ted Hughes. Fiesta Melons. In Benidorm there are melons, whole donkey carts full of innumerable melons, ovals and balls, bright green and thumpable, laced over with stripes of turtle dark green. Choose an egg shape, a world shape, bowl one homeward to taste in the white hot noon. Cream smooth honeydews, pink pulped whoppers, bump rinded cantaloupes with orange cores. Each wedge wears a studding of blanched seeds or black seeds to strew like confetti under the feet of this market of melon-eating fiesta goers. It's a nice poem. It's a fun poem with an almost cartoonish, almost disney energy, I want to say, to it. A poem that I think in any of our workshops here, we would all find much to praise and really enjoy. Not a poem that uh, gives a, an inkling of what's about to happen uh, in a very limited time in her work. The second poem, Balloons, was written only seven years later. Yeah, you have to, you have to turn pages. Like they stapled you in different order. Balloons parallels Fiesta Melons. They're both about large oval objects. Balloons. Since Christmas, they have lived with us, guileless and clear, oval soul animals, taking up half the space moving and rubbing on the silk invisible air drifts, giving a shriek and pop when attacked, then scooting to rest, barely trembling. Yellow cathead, blue fish, such queer moons we live with instead of dead furniture. Straw mats, white walls, and these traveling globes of thin air, red, green, delighting the heart like wishes or free peacocks blessing old ground with a feather beaten in starry metals. Your small brother is making his balloon squeak like a cat, seeming to see a funny pink world he might eat on the other side of it. He bites, then sits back, fat jug, contemplating a world clear as water, a red shred in his little fist. Uh, I've already noted that the subjects of these poems were remarkably similar, but the poems, not so. 
Let's consider the word ovals, which sensibly enough, given the topics, is shared by both poems. In the first poem, it is a literal description. Melons are ovals and balls, bright green and thumpable. Yes, that sounds like melons. Seven years later, Plath's balloons, no less literal, are described only in metaphorical terms as oval soul animals. To start, just listen to the music of that line, a triple slant rhyme with two long O's and three short A's, oval soul animals. That's the craft skill of practice and practice getting better over time. And then follow the metaphorical trail of those balloons through the rest of the poem. They are moving and rubbing on the silk invisible air drafts. They shriek, they scoot, they are yellow cat heads, blue fish, queer moons. They delight the heart, we are told. How so? Like wishes, hmm, that's pretty interesting, but she's just getting warmed up. They also delight the heart like free peacocks blessing old ground with a feather beaten in starry metals. At this point, my didactic apparatus fails me and I stand dumbstruck before Plath's metaphoric genius. Okay, to unpack it a bit, a peacock feather does look like it has been beaten in starry metals if one has a vivid, transformative imagination. So there's a grounding in real observation, but the leap to blessing old ground takes them into a peculiar spiritual realm, an interior realm in which Plath more and more operated in her final years. At root, Plath undergoes the inverse change to the one C.K. Williams makes. While looking out at the world enabled him to put his psychic concerns in context, Plath's greatness is interior. Objects appear before her, sheep, balloons, a train, a baby, and are immediately transformed into metaphor, into totemic symbols, into pure language. Plath relinquishes the world poetically. And yet I would insist that this is not, as is often claimed, some kind of accidental byproduct of Plath's obviously distressed mental state. This poem was written two days before her suicide, but it is not a poem of suicidal despair. It is not about hysteria or man-hatred or any other psychic boogeyman. It is a poem about her small children in a London apartment playing with balloons left over from Christmas. It is a poem that sees the world but sees it otherly, like light elementarily altered by its passage through the prism of the self. Let me show you one more pair of poems. I know that I don't, I'm, I'm not gonna go more than five more minutes. In which the contrast is even more stark, and I'll speed up my analysis even more. Here, I type that even in, knowing that I would have to do so. The first poem is called Two Views of Withens from 1957. Withens is a ruined farm cottage in Yorkshire, where, near where Ted Hughes was from, and it is reported to be the location in which, about which Wuthering Heights was written. Two views of Withens. Above whorled spindling gorse, sheepfoot flattened grasses, stone wall and ridge pole rise, prow-like through blurs of fog in that hinterland few hikers get to. Home of uncatchable sage hen and spry rabbit, where second wind, hip boot, help over hill and hill and through peaty water. I found bare moor, a colorless weather, and the house of Eros, low lintled, no palace. You, luckier, report white pillars, a blue sky, the ghosts kindly. There are recognizable movements in this poem. A colorless weather sounds like the late poems. A keen eye for description, but it's an altogether different poem from another landscape written just a few years later, Sheep in Fog. Another one of the last poems. Sheep in Fog. The hills step off into whiteness. People or stars regard me sadly. I disappoint them. The train leaves a line of breath. Oh, slow horse, the color of rust, hooves, dolorous bells. All morning, the morning has been blackening, a flower left out. My bones hold a stillness, the far fields melt my heart. They threaten to let me through to a heaven, starless and fatherless, a dark water. Withens describes in detail a hike to a picturesque farmhouse on the Yorkshire Moors. Sheep in Fog views a similar slice of the British pastoral in a shockingly different vein. What externalities there are, sheep, I think, fog, a passing train, are entirely, are little more than fuel for the poem's internalizing, metaphor-making machinery. 
Plath is no longer describing things. She is no longer saying this is, nor is she using the picture painting mechanics of depictive metaphor to say this is like this. Instead, she is fully engaged in the deep magic of metaphor as transfiguration, language as apotheosis. The final two poems here, which we can't really examine in detail, illustrate the apex of this process. Brasilia, for example, begins as if Plath were, had been reading some kind of Life magazine article about that strange new city in the jungle. Brasilia was founded in 1960, you'll recall, and this poem was written beginning of 63, but ends in a terrifying, dazzling vision of salvation and destruction. Words, one of her most famous late poems, begins and ends within the web of metaphor entirely. I guess I'll read it to you really quickly. Words. Axes, after whose stroke the wood rings, and the echoes. Echoes traveling off from the center like horses. The sap wells like tears, like the water striving to reestablish its mirror over the rock that drops and turns, a white skull eaten by weedy greens. Years later, I encounter them on the road, words dry and riderless, the indefatigable hoof taps, while from the bottom of the pool, fixed stars govern a life. If I was going to try to guide you through the metaphor, I would point out the poem is called Words. The word words doesn't, doesn't really matter in the poem. Instead, the first line is axes. So already the poem has leapt from a topic, words, directly into a metaphor, axes. Words are, there's an imaginary equal sign of metaphor, axes. Oh, words are like axes. Oh, really? How so? They don't seem like that to me. Well, after their stroke, the wood rings. Oh, OK, so words at some level are axe-like. They can damage. They can wound. They are a tool. and after them, the wood rings, the echoes. Oh, OK, there are echoes. Echoes, where do the echoes go? The echoes travel off from the center like horses. So the echoes created by an ax that isn't really a real ax, it's a metaphorical ax, have now generated horses. So one, a, a, an element in the poem that is entirely metaphorical has itself generated a new metaphor, horses. Well, what happens to those horses? Well, we don't hear about them yet. We hear about the sap. What sap? I guess the sap comes from the imaginary trees the metaphorical axe struck. OK. Well, that sap wells like tears, like the water. What water? There's no water in this poem. Water striving to reestablish its mirror. How does that enter the poem? Well, water striving to reestablish its mirror. It reestablishes its mirror after it's been broken by an object, and it has rings moving out and in a way analogous to the echoes we're told us move out. So a second level metaphor has itself found a simile of another similar uh, analogy. It's establishing its mirror because it's establishing mirror over the rock what rock that drops and turns. Before we can even focus on the rock or try to even see where it fits in the metaphorical structure, it has become a white skull eaten by weedy greens. Years later, as if this had been the act of a moment, as if there had been a time stamp anywhere in the poem, years later, I encounter them on the road. The stone, the water, the mirror, the ax, no, the horses. But now they're called words, finally. Words dry and riderless the indefatigable hoof taps, while from the bottom of the pool, which I guess is where that rock that turned into a skull went, fixed stars govern a life. One of her most famous late poems this is my last paragraph. Words begins and ends entirely within the web of metaphor. It is about the power of language to harm, also to transform, and mostly to transfigure the world. There are no real axes in it any more than there are horses or water or stones, only words, only the ideas of axes, only metaphor. Man, the tool maker, homo faber, and words are his most ingenious tool. There can be no words without us to speak them, just as an axe is purposeless without a woodcutter, and yet language again and again evades our surveillance, escapes our control. Poems resemble riderless horses wandering untracked lands. Words are the fixed stars that govern our lives. Thank you.